Welcome everyone to our webinar uh, about the RDM at technical universities. Uh, see how others do it. This webinar is uh, offered within the series uh, of webinars uh, offered by Fair Data Austria. And uh, my name is Tomasz Miksa, and I'm going to be the moderator today of this webinar. And if you are interested about getting the slides and seeing other webinars, you can visit uh, our website uh, as you can see the link in the links. And today uh, we're going to uh, have three speakers. We're going to have uh, Florina, Bernhard and Eduardo, and they are going to give us different perspectives on, uh, on the challenges, on uh, how they work uh, with data management plans, how they work with big data and what are the needs and challenges in a multi-university project. Uh, before we jump to their presentations, a uh, few announcements. So uh, please stay muted during the uh, webinar. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat. And uh, we expect to have a short slide before uh, every presentation. Then there will be a presentation. And after each presentation, there will be time for questions. So we have three speakers, three times times for questions. So please collect the questions in the in the chat. Uh, I think there will be also a possibility to unmute and ask the question out loud if you if you want to do so. So if everyone is ready, uh, I would like to start uh, with a quick slide. I have a few questions about uh, you. We would like to get to know you a little bit better. So if you can please go to the slido.com and put this um, code 68580 and answer the questions about your background. You can also use your mobile phone to scan the QR code. So if you can tell us uh, your background, so I know you can come up with any description you want. So you can tell us what's the domain you're working in, or what's your position, or what are your interests, you know. Uh, Okay, so we have some data stewards, librarians, research support, computer science the background, mostly research support I see now, geophysics. We have eight answers and we have 23 participants in the webinar. So uh, I'm waiting for some more answers. Okay, biological sciences is new, repository manager. Uh, but mostly research support. So I see that today's webinar is mostly attended by uh, people working at research support and not the researchers themselves. That's also fine because we want to offer the webinars to a wide spectrum of, of stakeholders. Okay, so we have uh, 14 answers. One more, maybe 15. Uh, okay, so the, the, the three key answers are library and repository manager and research support. Oh, we have also some ex-researchers. Uh, good. Uh, next question then for you is, um, where are you located? And here I also count on your uh, creativity. You can provide more than one answer if you want. Vienna. Graz, center of the world. <laughs> 1040 Vienna, Austria, Innsbruck. The other side of the street, I'm sure it's, it's, it's Florina. <laughs> Innsbruck, Leipzig, okay, so we have somebody outside of Austria as well. Mm, in front of the computer. University of Vienna, home. Uh, Let's wait for some more answers. Okay, so we have basically a mixture of people from Vienna and Graz and a few people from Innsbruck and, and Leipzig. Uh, and now maybe the last question I have uh, in this series of questions is about uh, your uh, experience with data management plans. And this is a question which is supposed to already put you in the mindset uh, for the first uh, presentation of Florina. So have you ever done any DMPs? Have you seen any of them? You don't know what it is. Okay, so most of you have seen some. There are some people who reviewed them, some people who wrote them. 
and there are also some newcomers who have no idea what DMP is and other. For all those who, who have other, uh, who, who selected the other options, you can tell us in chat what, what it actually uh, includes. What, why did you go for other? That would be interesting maybe. Okay, but uh, most of you have seen some uh, DMPs. And this brings me to Florina, who is going to be the first speaker. Florina is a senior researcher at Teuvin with a PhD in symbolic computation. In the last 10 years, her research has been focusing on domain-specific information retrieval, machine learning, natural language processing, and data science. And she has joined the Wuvin in 2011 and has been participating in and later coordinating over 20 research projects, both nationally and internationally funded. So Florina, I hand over to you and the floor is yours. You have roughly 20 minutes for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Tomek. So uh, let me share the screen. <clears throat> Good. So I believe you you see my you see my slides right now. So the title of my presentation today: So many projects, so little time uh, for DMPs. What we actually knew. So I am putting today my research ahead um, and going to show you some experiences with uh, from my own work with data management plans. Um, I I did not really expect that uh, people in the presentations do not know what a data management plan is. Um, I basically I was thinking maybe Tomek will give a very short overview, but in principle, it's it's a document or some kind of uh, um, Thing object where you where you ask a couple of questions uh, and uh, reflect a little bit about what you want to do with the data you are working with or planning to release or creating and so on and so forth. So, a little bit about myself. So, Tomek already introduced me. Um, thank you very much. So, I've, I've uh, doing computer science since 1996. Uh, my master thesis was in parallel and distributed computing. At that time, it was still lots of computing, no data. Um, I moved slowly towards data handling uh, during my PhD, still very strong computational aspects, of little data, but I started working, working with, um, uh, with mathematical um, knowledge, so um, repositories, and it, it's, it's a little bit much to say there were repositories, but still uh, places where we would put some data which, um, mathematical uh, theorem provers uh, could use. Um, and I basically am active in research since 2000. And my latest um, focus areas are uh, the ones mentioned before. And I also joined the uh, research data management team at the Teuvin a couple of weeks ago. The presentation today is includes all my work from, uh, from the data science uh, research unit and the project which I run here. Um, a little bit of a timeline here are some projects I've been uh, participating, contributing, leading in my career. I started very, very early uh, with uh, European funded projects and the two I listed here, Coast and Most, they handled medical data and some uh, not medical data, not medical user data, but um, data used by medical practitioners to keep up to date to latest developments in uh, in uh, medicine, in uh, pharmaceutical area. And that was already lots of uh, data coming in. Um, most was a continuation of that project. Um, from my point of view at that time as a PhD student, um, uh, we were contributing with uh, lecture content, so creating lecture content data for uh, students of uh, computer science uh, faculties. Then I have uh, had a very nice and sweet long period where I could do pure research in, in symbolic computation, finished my PhD. Afterwards, I have joined the TUBIN, and since then, projects became more and more uh, data heavy with uh, many of them uh, being related to evaluation of retrieval models. So if you are looking for information, um, 
the, the machinery, the computational machinery behind it, it's called a, a, a retrieval model. And that retrieval model uh, tries to understand the data you are giving it to him. And uh, according to your question, um, give you the uh, most relevant documents in a uh, order that should make sense to sense to you. So um, think maybe being Google Duck Duck, but it's not just that. So it's not just keywords. Uh, in any case, all these projects starting 2009, actually Promi started 2010, um, they became more and more data heavy. And um, um, nowadays we are working with uh, larger quantity and uh, all these data sets I've been working with are very diverse. So I, I've mentioned medical content. I have worked with uh, patent documents, uh, scientific articles, um, logs, mathematical content, images, lately more and more with ontologies and knowledge graphs. Um, the main uh, characteristic of, of all these data sets is that we handle text. So I, I am working more with text data, images, flowcharts, diagrams. These were more like a, a, a try out, but I am basically doing more uh, text uh, oriented information um, retrievals. So lots of data. Um, and while some of the projects in the framework Z uh, seven, um, like, like Promise Visceral and so on, um, uh, they did include some form of data management plan. It was not called like that at, uh, at the time, but uh, there was definitely some some concept to, to handle that data, uh, mostly driven by, by practical uh, reasons, because you wanted to, to be reused, you wanted to do further evaluation, you wanted to release the data. Um, I only became aware of uh, DMPs, of its data management plans around 2016. Um, and this is the red arrow there. So, so you see that it's, it's a very uh, new development in my own experience as, as uh, researchers. Um, so I, I, I will show now in the next some, some, some of the examples from, uh, from uh, of data management plans and how we arrived at them uh, very briefly actually, because it's not that, complicated once you know how to do it, of course. Um, there were two main reasons uh, why uh, data management plans actually became um, interesting for me personally, and I'm trying to, to sell this also to, to my colleagues and students. Um, first of one, uh, I have quite some experience with lost and found data because we didn't really take care how uh, where we put it. It was on some server, the servers tended to die, then there was a flood and uh, some hard drives died and so on and so forth. Um, database is lost. So this was really, really frustrating. I spent once more than a week looking for all the possible archives we, we had at the, at the Institute and on my own personal um, hard drive dumps and so on to, to find one data set used in the Admire project, which finished in 2015. Um, and the simple reason for me looking for the data was because I wanted to reuse it. And it was difficult to find it. I did find it. I did give it to one of the students for reuse and I didn't learn anything from this experience because if you ask me right now, where is the data? I'm actually not very sure. So, but I also do not have the time to, to recover it. Uh, and the second uh, driving uh, motivation for, for um, creating data management plans uh, comes from the funding agencies uh, as they have uh, very strong uh, uh, requirements right now uh, to, uh, to, to provide these data management plans because they, they see it as an, a research output, the data sets and, and software. It it's becomes uh, more important as a, as a research output for these agencies and they want to, to actually have a very uh, a overview of what has been produced, how is it used by other teams and so on and so forth. Um, and the blue arrow uh, points to um, where I have actually actively started uh, creating data management plans. 
So uh, I selected three projects, uh, which I, I think uh, are, are the most interesting for, for you because they are quite diverse in the documents produced for um, as data management plans. Um, let's start with IDSDL. Um, this was a project uh, funded by, by FFG um, in, in Austria. This is a national funding agencies, agency here. Um, and it was uh, called uh, Innovationslehrgang Data Science and Deep Learning. Um, and the idea of, of this project, which ran for about two and a half years, was to transfer state-of-the-art uh, know-how from research and universities um, in the domains of artificial intelligence, data science, uh, deep learning to the uh, IT industries in Austria. Why the need at the time? Because um, very many developments, especially in the deep learning and data science were so new that all the IT specialists already working in the industry, they, they um, they didn't have all that know-how and the universities only started teaching it at that point so there, there was a um, an estimated gap of five six years until these uh, uh, developments in data science and deep learning would actually arrive in the it industry in austria and even more time to be adopted um, so this, this was the, the uh, main focus of the Innovationslehrgang, um, IDSDL. Uh, we had uh, more than 20 industrial partners in, um, from Austria, and we had uh, five teaching models, modules where we, we basically gave a, a fresh course about all these subjects. And we even taught uh, uh, data stewardship and data management plans there. Uh, what was uh, specific about this uh, project is that every um, industrial partner had also to to run a transfer project. Uh, they were called transfer project, a kind of a cap exercise where they had to uh, pick one uh, data science related challenge in their own company. And together with um, researchers from our institute, they would uh, implement the ideas they have learned in the um, project in their own company. And one of the tasks in these transfer projects was to create a data management plan. Um, we expected about 10 to 20 plus DMP. So we had in total 24 companies, uh, some dropped out, uh, one or two dropped out um, uh, during the project, but still we had 20 plus projects we got quite a number of fewer uh, data management plans um, and the, the quality and the, the uh, types of documents were very um, um, varying quite a lot like this example taken from one of the uh, transfer project submissions and if, if you look at these documents basically the the um, student let's call him, her, like that, uh, only listed the concepts that data should have once it is uh, part of a data management plan or, or some ideas of how to, to uh, uh, release it, but nothing concrete. There, there is no standard that describes the data. There are only some indications about the format of the files. Um, there is no explanation why the data cannot be reused. Uh, they claim that the FAIR principles were fulfilled, but I am not sure after reading this document that they actually really understood what the FAIR principle was. So I, at least for this particular case, I have a very strong um, uh, belief that um, there was not enough time to understand what the data management plan was for this participant. And then we had, a, this is another example, a favorite of mine, this is it only this list of bullets. Um, now it does have a little bit more in terms of technical description. So it does now detail what kind of data is collected, but that's about it. Nothing about storage, nothing about ethical implications, nothing about uh, responsible persons taking care of the data. So basically here it is the data, that's it, we don't care about the rest because we are engineers. Yeah, these were programmers, engineers in the um, Austrian uh, large company. 
But we also had a couple of positive examples, and I was really happy to to uh, receive this one because that uh, this this uh, group of students uh, we we had grouped them per per projects per companies and so on. They actually used the DMP online tool to create uh, management plans. So they they did think about every single uh, single question related to the data. Um, also legal compliance, and I remember having some discussions with them because they didn't know, okay, what, what happens if I fill in this data? Where does this information I give you go? And uh, will, affect, will it affect my business um, if, if, you know, gets leaked? So lots of, lots of um, um, foggy situations, which for me at the time, uh, we, we minimized it because we wanted to, them only to learn about the things and we told them don't put anything that is business sensitive there just think uh, about it and do it as an exercise so at least one uh, successful uh, data management plan uh, out of uh, 20 plus expected now another project i'm, I'm will going i'm going to show you uh, Further data management plan creations from two Horizon 2020 projects, which uh, are running currently. Um, the first one, Ontotrans, is um, a project that um, focuses on an ontology-driven uh, open translation environment. So it, it creates an uh, open translation environment. Um, translation in this context is not. Uh, what what you think of when you do language translation, but it's more about transfer of expert knowledge to solve industrial um, applications, uh, um, innovation cases. Like uh, one um, industrial participant, they, they are developing um, pre-prex materials and films, and they have a very concrete uh, problem that their, their surfaces have just too many uh, air uh, bubbles captured there. So how should they modify the formula? How should they modify the, the industrial process, temperatures and so on, so that these surfaces becomes flatter. And these now are industrial uh, companies where they do not have the, the capacity to, to follow the research and uh, the development. So they, they uh, employ the services of a translator who would take their innovation case, their problem, and then they would do some modeling, they would do some experimentation, and basically they translate the problem into something which is then uh, uh, solvable by the, by the company. Um, and this, this uh, process in this project, uh, we, we are um, employing ontologies to, uh, to drive this process in a more efficient way and especially cross-domain adaptable. You can look, uh, details about this project on, on this website. So different type of data, material sciences. This is now nothing to do with text anymore, but still lots of uh, semantical information because we needed to understand about uh, processes and uh, data is not that large, but the semantics behind it, it's quite rich. And uh, of course, be, this being an Horizon 2020 project, we have, we had to, we, we were required to provide a data management plan by, by the funding agencies. Um, and in, in this uh, project, we went uh, in a more systematic way to create these documents. We used, um, um, use uh, at least one of the templates that were available at the time. I think right now it's a little bit different from what we used. I will show it to you in a minute. Um, and what was really um, uh, revealing for me, because as a researcher, I mean, yeah, well, data, it's there. I, I want to share it with everybody here. It is, please take it. Um, we had extensive discussions with the industrial partners, what exactly that plan means and what does what does it mean to describe the data? They were worried that the metadata they would they would give, you know, uh, what do the columns represent in their data sets? They give out information about their business uh, uh, and proprietary data. They they give uh, they would disclose information about the the tools and the software uh, they are using, about the machinery they are using, models and so on and so forth. So this this would 
their fear was that uh, they would become uh, vulnerable to attacks if you have some kind of information, you know, uh, what kind of machinery you are using. So very, very intense discussions to explain them what it, what it is and what uh, data management plan would, uh, would mean for them. Um, and we had um, long discussion to clarify the concepts of a data management plan, especially these fair principles. What exactly did it mean in in the con in their context? And these are these are large established companies. So it's it's not just some uh, not it's not a startup which um, works in some kind of a digital uh, setting. No, these are uh, large companies where. Uh, business uh, and, and proprietary data has a um, higher impact on, on the whole uh, company. So um, what we did in this project, we, uh, we took every single uh, use case we were working in, and then for each of the use case, we were uh, extrapolate, um, extracting and uh, thinking, what is the data we are working with? How does it look like? And uh, we have uh, had uh, eight such documents, and maybe you recognize this uh, this, this table here, um, where we go to, to describe the data, in, be, give a general summary, then uh, explain how the FAIR principles are addressed uh, uh, with this data, which meta standard, metadata standards we use to describe it, and so on and so forth. So we collected eight such documents, we discussed for some of the cases for hours. Um, and then we collected everything into this deliverable, uh, which uh, it's it's a confidential deliverable. I was a bit surprised to see this, but I also can understand it given the fact that these are industrial partners with very strong uh, confidentiality um, fears. Um, and this is a very nice long PDF file. I think it says about I don't know, 50, 60 pages. Um, there is another similar project that uh, does about the same uh, same thing. Uh, now, another uh, very interesting project I, I want to show you, it's the dossier, which is now a kind of a meta project. Is a, is it, it, it is a training network, Marie Curie, uh, Marie Sudoska Curie network. And it consists actually of 15 projects, research projects, 15 PhDs. Um, and of course, we had uh, to, to create a data management plan. Um, what I did here is I just uh, took a top-down approach. And this was basically me sending the students uh, requests, you have to do this. Um, and we collected first the, the uh, Sets, the number of sets we wanted to work with. Uh, this is what we what we received, and um, it was a little bit easier for this data management plan because lots of the data is actually reused. In which case, we do not have we can um, uh, stop thinking about uh, issues like uh, ethics and repositories because they were already out there. The newly created ones we created we we have. Uh, uh, in the data management plan, such tables. Um, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of this data set because this was one of the triggers uh, to for me to actually publish data act with a DOI and everything. Now, I rushed a little bit through the last project, but uh, some of the lessons learned, um, and I, I don't know if you noticed, but all are just PDF files and they're static. Um, I am uh, not aware of, of any follow-up on, on these uh, data management plans. Yes, we created, they are there, but uh, what is, and now what? Um, and at least from, from my information status right now, um, I, I do not see how it is uh, retrievable for statistics. The formats are so different that uh, I, I it's, it takes actually a, a human uh, to, to look at them and review them and call, extract that information into some kind of uh, database which can be queried. Um, then there is a lot of, uh, lots of things are not clear, especially the, the why question in, in the researchers' communities. Yeah, you, 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 can, you, you force me now to create these documents, but I don't see the benefits yet. Um, and from my interactions with uh, all the various actors while creating this uh, these data management plans, um, they 
abhor additional overhead. For them, this is not really, you know, they want to do their research, they want to publish the papers and so on. The data for them, it's, uh, it, it's yes, in my domain, it's there, but I don't want to start now describing it. Um, so the main uh, message I got from these people is that, yeah, please keep it simple. Um, and what, what I've also observed in my domain, machine learning, uh, data science and so on, uh, the, the researchers just released the data somewhere. Uh, I didn't make no, take now a, a screenshot from, from Kaggle or Hugging Face. They have their own area for data sets. And if you look there, there is some kind of structure in, in how these data sets are released and you can even search through them. But those are, um, those are not, there is no data management plan behind them. Um, so what we'd like uh, as researcher, I, I think um, simple, very simple guidelines, at least somewhere to start with, uh, are very helpful. And actually such guidelines are um, uh, available from the, from the research center. I actually used them in one of the projects. Uh, helped me quite a lot also to explain it to, to the people why this is necessary. Uh, of course, we want small overhead to, to create all this. Um, and I think it would be very, very good to have some kind of an early introduction to the whole ecosystem of, of data management. And we need first, at least in, in my area, the proof of ben benefit um, on, of creating this data management plan is not that obvious. Um, we are more interested or researchers are interested in the citations and everything, but not in giving this information to the funding agencies because this is for them more or less administration. Right? And I think institutional support, um, like, you know, uh, new students, uh, they won't uh, take care of how they handle the data, how they put it, where they uh, arrange it, how they document it, if their advisors or, or, or the research community they are embedded in don't do that. I know lots of community researcher communities like in, in the biomedical domains and so on, they have already established standards and um, sometimes they, they cannot even answer the question, why do you do it like this? Well, everybody does it, so of course I do this. Um, many other research areas don't. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And any questions you have, post them in chat or send emails or yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Florina, for your presentation. Do we have any questions for Florina? Uh, if you have any, I think you can just unmute and ask directly because I don't see anything in chat chat. So I would have only one quick question. Uh, how do you think, uh, Florina, um, Maybe the problem that people don't really know how to write a DMP is because they get to know about it too late. And in general, these data management skills, maybe this is something we should teach people much earlier. And the question is, should it start at school, at the bachelor level, PhD level? Should we try to talk to professors first or maybe to students? So where, where would you start planting these ideas and if you think it, if it, really, if it really helps? Photo management software. <laughs> so you can start actually already in, in school because kids take lots of uh, pictures. Uh, that would be one way of, to, to uh, teach them about uh, why it's good to have some kind of data management, but most of them are just uploading them to the cloud. Um, probably already early in their studies, in the university studies. Mm -hmm. especially if they are going into any direction where data plays a central role to their work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we need to move on to the next presentation we have. And before we do that, I have again a, a quick slider uh, for everyone. So please uh, wake up in case you are not listening. And, and uh, there is a new code for the Slido, so you have to go to slido.com and this time uh, type this number 1371505. I'm putting it to the chat. And we would like to know where do you keep your research data? So where do you keep your data during the, the project? Since many of you are from the research support, uh, you can tell us where your researchers that you support 
where do they keep uh, the research da data mostly? So this is like, is it a, oh, well, we have the first answer, database. Uh, is it a local computer? Is it a USB stick? Is it somewhere in the cloud? Uh, you say at our storage, you mean storage provided by your uh, university or institution? A red cap, local computer, cloud, network drive, servers on our institute, local database, on-premise server, Okay, depends on the phase in the research life cycle, public repositories, next cloud, local computer, local folders. Okay, we have 12 answers. We used to have like 15, I would wait for three more. <laughs> next cloud. Okay, uh, let's move to the next question then. Uh, the next one is, um, where do they publish the data? So uh, the assumption here is that in the previous question, I were asking like, what do they do with the data as they work with the data? And once it has some stage, they want to publish the data because I don't know, they have uh, published a paper and they want to share the data or the project comes to an end. Uh, how do they make this uh, data uh, visible, accessible, fair to the world? Okay, so that's another data verse. So research data repository. So I see some marketing from, from the people at the tool. <laughs> data is not published. Okay, yeah, that's also happening. Supplementary material for publication, research gate, Tetis, institutional repository. Yeah, number one being the nodo. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us what Tetis is? Because I this is the first time. I hear about it. It's, I guess it's some kind of an own name for a repository or something else. If you can type in the chat later. Okay, but there are also data which is not published. And is it not published because uh, they don't want to or they cannot because I know it's sensitive or, or things like this? Peer reviewed journal supplements is the new answer. We have still one person typing. GitHub. Okay. Uh, Dataverse. Uh, so this brings us to the next presenter, uh, Bernhard from Teuvin. Bernhard received his doctoral degree in geodesy and geoinformation from Teuvin in 2018. And as part of the Teuvin Remote Sensing Research Group, has been involved in projects from uh, European Space Agency, European Union, Copernicus Global Land Services. Copernicus Emergency Management Services and Austrian Research Promotion Agency, FFG, mainly working on the exploitation of satellite data and the development of operational processing software for synthetic aperture radar observations. Uh, Bernhard, I would like to hand over now uh, to you and uh, please uh, let us know about your experiences of working with big data. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas, for this uh, introduction and also for inviting me here to this webinar. Um, uh, so I go to my full screen here. I hope you see it. The slide. Excellent. So moving away here some windows. Yeah. So my name is Bernhard Baumer Schallinger, and um, I'm from the Remote Sensing Group at the Geo Department at TU Wien. And I've now the honor to <laughs> extend greetings from Planet Big Data to you. Uh, and tell a story about how we publish global satellite image data at the Turin Research Data Repository. And uh, first of all, I give some introduction to our group. Uh, so we are the remote sensing group, and uh, this is a photo from our retreat last month uh, at Semmering. We actually had quite some luck with the weather, so we could go for a hike. Um, we are about 20 scientific and student staff um, working on Earth observation. So we're using satellites and uh, airplanes to look down on the Earth. And um, with satellite imagery and signal analysis, we uh, derive what we call geophysical variables like vegetation density, health, uh, soil moisture, soil composition, land cover, water bodies, and many more of this. 
So we are looking down on Earth and see what's going on, what are the dynamics, what is the status. Um, satellite radar imagery, we are working much with radar data. What can you imagine here, what, what, what I'm talking about? So this is an uh, image from the Copernicus Satellite 1 satellite. Uh, this is part of the Copernicus fleet. So there are about 20 satellites in the orbit working in Earth observation for the European program. <clears throat> and this, this one is carrying a synthetic Apache radar sensor. This is this uh, golden uh, panel here. And uh, here, microwaves are emitted, sent down to the, to the surface, then some interaction reflection is going on. And the echo, the received, what was going back to the sensor, that's the received signal we are analyzing. And in this example, this is orbiting uh, over Europe here. We see here Ireland and Scotland sensed by the sensor, giving us an image. And two important facts uh, to take home for you here. Because of uh, this microwaves with about five centimeter wavelength, we can um, uh, look through clouds. So we can uh, penetrate the clouds. We see down to the earth. This is a big contrast to the optical data, which are often blocked by optical by, by clouds. And the other thing is it's an active system. So we don't need any daylight or anything. We bring our own illumination here. Um, <clears throat> Some more slide about the principle, what's going on. So the sensor is in the orbit, in the, in the space, sending down the microwaves. And in case of water, you see this specular reflection. So it goes away completely and nothing is coming back to the sensor. So here we have, would have a dark image. Over some soil, some ground, we have a more diffuse scattering. So something is going back with a bit of higher signal. And in case of a city, <clears throat> we have this double bounce effect. So the microwaves coming double bounce, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and going back to the sensor. And here we have a really high signal. And uh, how is the observation going on? So we have uh, this nice movie here with two satellites doing the same thing, 180 degrees apart. And over 12 days, uh, the complete globe is observed, and we get a full image of the surface. Um, examples for the application of this data, for one, there's this precise terrain analysis. We can do elevation models, uh, monitor volcanic and tectonic activities, then vegetation status and health. So we can do yield predictions and map the forest developments. For example, rainforest um, cutting down can be measured quite well with this system. Land cover is a big topic, so water body mapping and flood alerts, so water that's not supposed to be there. It's a an, big issue. Um, Desertification and uh, soil uh, uh, developments you can measure with the system. Soil moisture is a big topic in our group, so we work towards drought estimation and um, measure how much irrigation in the agricultural fields is done. Ship detection is another thing, and many more. Um, how does this data look like? So this is one example over the Western Iran area. Um, you see here this typical uh, radar signature. See city with these high values, desert with some more diverse pattern. You can uh, see the mountain ranges uh, and also a lake, so the water body. A an image from the center level one, uh, uh, which will be our um, data we publish with, with this big data uh, uh, deposit at the TOV research data is coming from these images. So they have about 250 and 170 kilometer in extent. And this is about one gigabyte. One such an image has the volume of one gigabyte. The thing is, uh, with the satellites, we get a thousand of these images per day. So it's one terabyte a day we need to process, store, and analyze. So that's bringing us to the domain of big data. And it did forced us actually in Vienna that we form a data cube, that's what we call it, to manage all these volumes. And this is now a very busy slide uh, showing the infrastructure we built up together with our partners uh, in the hard and the software side. Uh, I have uh, many buzzwords for you, like petabyte storage, gigabit, Ethernet, supercomputer, cloud platform. All this was put together by the Earth Observation Data Center the EDC ourselves and uh, the Vienna scientific cluster. So the big um, federation of supercomputing facilities from the Austin Univers universities. So where we could uh, do a big processing jobs. And this was all necessary to 
being able to work with all this data to make it useful to get the information from the data. <clears throat> Our general, general approach here is uh, that we use our scientific algorithms here in the brown line to ingest the raw satellite images to our brown pipeline here, pre-processing retrieval algorithm to get uh, physical variables like soil moisture or water bodies. And we need the data cube to collect all the data and to perform the calibration that we can build our models for the retrieval algorithm. And in the end, what we are heading at our group is uh, also for operational services. So this is part of this European Copernicus program where we deliver globally and near real time. So some hours after satellite sensing these variables to the users so that they can use it. So it's open, it's accessible. And uh, that's the framework we are dealing here. One more slide about the data structure, which we invented some years ago um, with this uh, continental split, so that don't we don't have this big geographic stretching, for example, here in Greenland, which is much larger as it should be. So we have these continental grids. Here we have the tiling, and within such a tile, we stack the images, and then we have uh, can access the images, but also the time series. So there is red uh, vertical line here is that we can perform our analysis to do our work. And all this was necessary that we could achieve this project I present here today. This is the Sentinel-1 global backscatter model, giving you uh, maps of uh, radar reflectivity of the land surface of the Earth. So basically how a radar would see the Earth. So it's like Google Earth, but with radar. And this was a big project funded by the ESA, by the European Space Agency, and we carried it out here in Vienna. And it's a mosaic, so it, we collected about 500,000 of these images and had um, data volumes with the intermediate product of about more than one petabyte of images. And uh, this is a 10 meter fixed spacing, and I hope this works that uh, I can show you now the browser. And this is Vienna uh, in this data set. So you see here Vienna with these high values. You see the, the, the Danube River, you see the Neue Donau, the Alte Donau, you see the bridges, you see a lot of features. You see agricultural fields, you see the airport. In the center right now, you have the Wienerwald, the, the forest, and yeah. The point here is it's really, this is a data view we implemented on our server. So just for visualizing and panning and zooming, but it should give you the impression uh, about the detail this data provides and also about the volume what's behind it because you can zoom everywhere on the globe down to the 10 meter pixel spacing. And yeah, so this is a, just an impression. And if you, you this detect really cool features if you want. Yeah, the Ganges River going into the Indian Ocean. Um, so I go back to my PowerPoint. And yeah, this is the Vienna example. Uh, so we have this really big data set and then uh, I'm now presenting how we uh, made a publication out of it and used the TU research data repository to achieve this. So this is this uh, um, product we, did, we published. So it's two mosaics actually, one in the VV, so the polarization band VV, the other one is VH, then there were all statistical layers, but we selected two of them to make publish. It's the first data set of this kind. And it was also for us the first data set with this really large, uh, large volume we saw meaningful to share with the community. So actually there can be made a lot of, a lot of added value like for land cover classification, water body mapping, mapping of cities and urban areas, uh, soil type determination, and maybe more, we don't know. So we wanted to share this with the communities that they make something out of it. Uh, for example, this is zooming into, into Bordeaux in France with the Atlantic Ocean, uh, having here some river uh, inset here, and on the right, typical land cover classes for the area. So you might see here this correlation, what you can do with some easy operations. Um, 
So this project has some history. Uh, in 2018, it was achieved to get these big mosaics. So within this ESA project, we had this one per petabyte of data and effectively 75 terabytes of output layers, which was really the final results. So this was 2018. Then 2020, some time passed by, and we thought, hey, shouldn't we publish this cool data set? It's really cool. It's why should only we work with this? Then we, yeah, we should write a paper. Uh, but just a paper. Then maybe publish also some of the core layers, so these mosaics. And we selected the two main one of them, and they are about three terabytes. And then we had some thoughts: how, how, where can this be published? So ESA, so the funder itself, they had no resources or capability to host it. Then we pretty soon figured out that Google and the others we really don't like to host our data. We had some contacts with a Dutch company called Surf Sarah, uh, which were really supportive. But then in the progress, it came out, we are not Dutch, so this might be a problem. So this, and then it, the data set was really big. So this somehow was a dead end for us. Then we had uh, contacts with the TU Center for Research Data Management, so colleagues who are also here in this uh, webinar. And there we pretty soon found out that our requirements can be met. And that we can act as a pilot user. So because this was a really at that time, as I grasped the early stage of this repository, but we were welcome. And 2021, we could deposit this uh, data set successfully. So we had it online first under an embargo, because the peer review process of our paper here was still in the ongoing. And then after this uh, peer review was uh, completed and we could publish the paper, we could also release the embargo and the data set was fully released to the community. Um, some facts about this data set. So we have one DOI, one digital ob object identifier that was generated by the research data repository. We have two global mosaics. So for the two, two bands. We split it up in six continents and this 100 kilometer tiles on the continents. Then we grouped this to 12 zipped collections. And so we could keep our grid and tile structure as folder file structure. And we could keep also the file nomenclature we had initially. And uh, this ended up into the individual files of over 30,000 GeoTIFF files. So uh, with this 10 meter pixel size and the geo the geo metadata. So overall, we have here the statistics, how large the individual downloads uh, are in terms of data volume. Uh, but yeah, we could transport this uh, very easy to the repository and also to the download uh, links. Um, this brings me to the landing page uh, we have at the TU Wien Research Data Deposit. And for us, this is really a cool thing because it comprises a lot we actually wanted and then figured out we need. So first of all, we have the DOI and we have a version. We could uh, add a data set citation. We have a textual high level description of what this data set is. We have a preview file so to make it a bit with also with an illustration. We have 10 download links for the collections. And then we have core facts about the data record, the description and available codes to use this data. We have the link to this browser-based data review I've shown you before. We have a link to the preview article, a link to the funding organizations, and link to the related works. So we have here more than we had initially thought we need. So this is really, I'm really happy with this. Um, this brings me to my summary and acknowledgement slide, telling you which of our requirements could be met. Just recapping here, so we have the open access, we have the citation, we have the DOI, we have the license, we have the version control. We could host the three terabytes of data. We can keep our time of file structure. We have actually handable downloads so with these 10 links, uh, 12 links for the collections, just description, documentation. We have the links to the related works, and we have the long term accessibility with the, at I think, at least 10 years. It's guaranteed that this data set is hosted. In addition to this, through the direct communication with the TU Center of Research and Data Management, so colleagues like Thomas here, we initially could use an FTP upload of the, of the, of the mosaics from our storage in Vienna at the EDC partner. 
Uh, we got uh, some download user statistics, which are really interesting for us, how many people are downloaded and which continents are downloaded. And <clears throat> last but not least, we got a lot of really good help and support in all related questions we had towards this publication process. My last slide is some lessons, really core lessons we learned in during this process. First of all, a DOI link is persistent. A link to a repository, a link to a paper, perhaps not. So this is really like a more permanent thing, which is, was new to me. Uh, another lesson is when, when one plans a data-focused project, some questions should be faced early. For example, what is the estimated data set volume? Discuss early about access and license options you want to have or you can have. Think about the shareability and how to make it usable. And this brings me, I stole this from the webinar, no, the workshop two weeks ago by the TU Center for Research Data Management. Uh, actually consider drafting a data management plan. Like uh, uh, it was said in the talk before, because I really agree with it, it makes you think in the early phase, what data you will use and where do you get it from? What infrastructure, what hardware, what software, what licenses do you need? What will be really the output? What's the target? You need to find it much more earlier in terms of the data structure and how you will share your research outputs. And generally, I also agree with this, that when you plan a research project, think about these fair principles. So is it is it okay? And if it's okay, please go for it. It's it should be findable, it should be accessible, it should be interoperable, it should be reusable, reusable, because then you can share it. And then you might get more added value than you think in the beginning. So that brings me to my final slide, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, now we're waiting for questions for Bernhard. So does anyone have any question? If so, please unmute and ask. I think people are very shy today. Okay, uh, I would have one question because it's a common uh, challenge, I would say. Uh, we all discuss in the community that researchers should be getting credit for the data sets they create as well, so that basically others are citing their data sets. And uh, do you have any experience that people cited your data set already? Or you still uh, get the fame from <laughs> people citing your uh, paper and describing the data set? Yeah. Um, most people that uh, are coming to us and asking for the S1 GBM, this data set, this global backslider model, uh, they know it from the paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because the paper and yeah, it's easily spread. It's the same with the DOI, but mm -hmm. uh, it's not the first entry point. I think also if you Google it, it's it, it's the paper. It's not the the, the repository. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, I would say we have. If, I'm still sh sharing the screen, right? No, 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 no. Okay. Um, I, can, I can stop sharing if you want. We have to share again. Um, also here, <clears throat> we provided here the links both to the repository and to the paper. Mm -hmm. So we could interconnect all these three things, the paper, the repository, and this web viewer to each other. And at least here within this circle, uh, uh, we, know, we, we made sure that it's interconnected. Mm -hmm. What would be important to us is this uh, download statistics. So we could get it from you through asking, but if this is like manageable from the from the portal, this would be really cool, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Let's move on now to the next speaker. No, uh, wait a second, I have a question. Yes, okay, go on. The <laughs> You're Sorry, the next speaker, so ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I missed something. So you said that you create this model in which it's a set, set a stack, so it's in time. But you is that in, on the data you share? So or is what you share is only one screenshot, one time zero time? Can can the user go through the time? 
No, no. What what we shared, what we published in this publication is this mosaic. So it's the aggregation from this data cube to two layers. So uh -huh. taking two years of data, condense it, reduce it to ah, two layers. Okay. Uh, and this is what's published. So this is like harmonized, normalized. I didn't, I forgot about this detail. Thank you oh, for okay. the discussion, uh, for this question. If you want to go to the data cube, you need to actually ask us or the EDC partner to get like a access to the platform and then do your own analysis, which is also like possible. But published was this reduced, condensed, harmonized mosaic. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Now we have to uh, move on to the last presentation. Uh, but before that, I again have some uh, slides. I have two questions for you. Again, the same link you had before. So uh, to put you in the mood for the last presentation, I would like to ask you about the uh, aspects of research data management that are most challenging to you or that you have observed that are most challenging to the uh, researchers. So what is the hardest thing for them? or for you, as if you are a researcher. Okay, if I have the first answer, research engagement, but from these typical tasks that you do as a researcher, for example, you know, finding the right storage or uh, picking up the license or selecting a repository, uh, I don't know, uh, things like this, that what are the things that you do when you uh, manage the data that people don't have idea on how to do that? Version management, getting rights and license decisions from project partners, integrating multiple data sets with others, We have still four people typing, so let's wait for the answers. Rights and licenses, proper description and metadata, follow up the plans, chasing the contributors to keep to the standards. Okay, we have nine answers, maybe one more. Documenting, proper description of metadata. Okay, uh, let's move to the next question, the last question for today. Uh, what are the challenges in general in multi-university projects? So if you have a project in which several partners are included, not only your uh, group, not only your research group, uh, what is the most challenging thing? And it, this, is, this doesn't have to be uh, about research data management. It can be in, in general about the collaboration in such a multi-university project. And the first answer, unified cooperative platform usage, compatibility in data management, focus is put in publishing, not in sharing data. The platform. So the platform, I guess, selecting the platform or agreeing on using one, or providing access for everyone to the platform. Uh, connecting different data sets, archives, deposits, communication. Missing cooperative platforms, only office is not a good option. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, cloud tools, non-EU based. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you very much for participating in the poll. Uh, now I would like to introduce our uh, last speaker, Eduardo uh, from TU Graz. Eduardo is a physicist from the National University of Colombia. He did his PhD in theoretical chemistry at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Spain. In 2017, he joined the CDL for mass transport through paper led by Karin at the Graz, there he implemented and applied segmentation methods to analyze X-ray tomography scans of cellulose materials. In 2022, so this year, he was appointed as a senior scientist at the Institute of Solid State Physics at the Graz. 
he's the researcher responsible for the Graz Micro City Consortium and X-ray tomography infrastructure of which the of, of which the Graz University of Technology, the Karl Francis University of Graz, and the medical universities are part. Eduardo, uh, the, the, the floor is yours. Please share your screen. Uh, just one. There is a typo. I was appointed 2020. Okay. Uh, let me see multiple adventure option. Uh, have you already gave me the option? Or? Yes, yes. You can just show your screen. Okay. There is a green button. Ah, okay, bottom. now I see it. You have roughly 20 minutes for your presentation. Uh, Do you see my my presentation? Yes, we can online? see it. Yes, please go on. So uh, I'm going for that. Okay. So my presentation is about uh, more or less about our uh, the RDN that we are doing here in our uh, laboratory. I think I can skip this. So let's go directly to who we are. When Grass Micro City Consortium is a consortium formed by the three main universities in Grass. Technical University of Graz, Graz uh, Carl Franz University, and Medical University of Graz. The facility was granted by FFG and is quite a new laboratory. The machines uh, were installed on December 2021, so less than one year. So basically, we are a facility that offers X ray computer tomography infrastructure and service to study the internal structure and behavioral material at different landscapes. Um, in this consortium, uh, there are 13 institutes, uh, let's say the VIP members. Uh, they have a really broad spectrum of interest, as you can see here. Uh, they work uh, are interested in paper, pharmaceutical products, biomass, metal and alloys, rocks, concrete, batteries, and medical devices. However, we are not restricted to this institute. We have also measurements with other institutes and other uh, researchers. And also, we do some uh, commercial measures. This is a view of the laboratory. Uh, here on the on the right, you can see the so-called Unitom HR. So we have two machines. Uh, this machine is the uh, machine for high re resolution. So we achieve some micro spatial spatial resolution. This is for uh, small samples. On the la left side, you can see the big machine. So it's a machine with high power, high energy, and it's for dealing with samples with a high density and or bigger samples. Uh, however, we pay in, in resolution. It's, the resolution is lower than in this, in this machine. Now let's go to the topic of RDM. As I said before, our main goal is to have a three-dimensional representation of the composition and morphology of, of, of an object. So, this goes to the first question, what kind of data we generate? Uh, image. Basically, we generate image, and in our case, uh, it's in TIT files. And this is really good because uh, this is a standard. So it's something that you can reuse, uh, it's interoperable, and you can uh, share it, and really good for long-term archiving. Uh, we produce two types of sets of, of, of image or of data. The first one is uh, mainly this is produced by the machine. And this is the so-called projection or another, uh, we also call it radiograph. And it's, uh, it's an image of the transmission through the, the, of the S-ray through the sample. Uh, once we have this, the computer, this is why we call it microcomputer tomography, the computer take all this data and apply an algorithm and create the so-called reconstru uh, reconstruction slice. This is the uh, this slice that you uh, uh, stack all together. Uh, we, we call it set, set, a stack. You have the virtual representation of the object, so you have a three-dimensional representation of your of your sample. Uh, and this is the, these guys are basically the primary information that the user uh, get at the end of the experiment. The after that, the, the user can generate new data new data as structural descriptors. So for example, you can go and to do segmentation and to try to and, uh, have some descriptor that give you, for, uh, for example, the porosity, the porosity, and so on. But this in, is the responsibility of the user, not our main responsibility. Now, 
Let's continue with this uh, of the topic of data collection and documentation. Uh, we produce, in, uh, as I say, in two steps, uh, how it, uh, the data is generated. In the, so in the first part, we do the acquisition. And this, in this case, what we have is the object in front of the S-rays and we rotate the object and take a lot of, the, a, a lot of projection. And this is a really huge, well, not as comparison of Bernard, but it's, it's a large uh, set of data and depends on the resolution. For me, uh, this is uh, really the raw data. I, in, this, in this case, it's quite important to uh, acquire all the metadata related with, with the experiment. This is the, the mostly the information that needs to go in some kind of publication with how you describe how you did the study. Once you have this all this set of data, we go to the next step, which is the so-called reconstruction. And in this case, we take all these guys and we project it back to the center of rotation. And we apply the algorithm and we have the, the uh, reconstruction slice. However, here, the as as is as, as is an algorithm and there is a lot of interaction also with the with the user with me i apply some criteria so here i can apply a lot of filters noise filter i can reduce the region of interest i can enhance the history so this is a, a, a lot of information that also is metadata and needs to that is the reconstruction settings and i can create as as, as much as, as volumes i want i want from the same uh, uh, set of data so this is give, uh, bring me to the other thing. I also use the software that is the software from the company, from, from TSCAN. In principle, this, this is an algorithm that can be done for, by another three parties, but the same, the same, um, same, so, um, same volume is not possible to reproduce it using another third party. So the, here, this is something important for, for the uh, data management. And as I say, it's the object that the user uh, take with, uh, with him. With them. Now, more or less about what is my, our experimental workflow. So the user arrives with a question, I want a sample, I want to see something in this sample, and I, am, I, I take care of the sample preparation, I take care of the acquisition and reconstruction. Then the user takes his object and they need to do the, the image analysis and to produce the, the final result. So I, am, I take all care of this, not, not of this, but I also a user time to time. So I need in, in some po at some point also to, to participate on this. And I, in some of the projects, I also, I am part of the, uh, I am a, a co-researcher. But for this presentation, I am really taking care and for the main consortium taking care of the RDN related with the protocols. How is the, all the experiment done about the image generated and on all this process, the metadata related with all the uh, workflow and Quite important for me is the experimental database. All the experiments uh, that are collected here are those to the database, uh, database and are with all the metadata. So the, from this uh, database, we can extract useful information. We can reuse data. Uh, lucky for us, we started the, the, the process, the RDN administration one year in advance. So, so we applied for the digital Teograss marketplace in 2020 and um, with the so-called British project. And we got from the, from, from the, with this project uh, a repository and most important, an, an, a student project employee who really designed uh, all the previous workflow and all the uh, protocols and uh, scripts to do our ma ma uh, research data management. At the beginning, we were, were thinking that we will uh, acquire one machine and we create this, uh, this was our proposal to send everything to an us and then also to send all the information related to the users, to the so-called, uh, to Cybers Austria. And our idea was that the user can use this shared platform to do, to do the uh, image analysis. However, this is not, was quite naive because Cybers is really good for really large databases, but not for image analysis. For image analysis, you need a GPU rendering, and also software that can be shared in, in this platform. And also we uh, we wanted to establish the, the connection to Invino RDN to publish the data there. Now, uh, from that first part, we got uh, several good results. What well, we established a really workflow for working with two machines. We, we did uh, automatic gen ID generation for dealing with every experiment. We uh, 
have some scripts to which uh, uh, update our database from from the new experiments. The uh, scripts that also take all the information for each experiment and um, and send it to the database. And we have also the we create our website. In a really fast view, this is more or less how looks my database. I have a really large uh, main folder with a lot of experiment with his unique identifier. From this uh, folder, uh, I have everything organized in the same way. So I have the acquisition, the reconstruction, and the support information related with the experiment. And from this uh, main, from main folder, I apply my uh, my algorithms and I have my uh, my experimental database. And this is I have two experimental database for your machine. And this base the database allows me also to have information that controls the finance uh, administration. I, I need to send bills to the to the users. This is uh, as I say before. This is quite important database because allow me to, pre to prepare a new experiment based in the previous knowledge of other experiments. All this information here is sent to the data storage, and I, I also do a backup. Uh, it is quite important in, in, uh, in data management to, to keep in the relation between data clear in the file names. So our ID really has all a good uh, metadata related with the experiment. I have the absolute number of the experiment. I have the number of the machine, the sample, and the number of scans that I have done on the same sample. I have the main uh, use, uh, uh, main researcher and their institute, or either the, the project involved and the date where the, the experiment was done. Don, uh, uh, I want to come back again to the my experimental workflow because we realized during the first the first time uh, with the machines that it was necessary to do to have some uh, standard how to do this the experiment and how to do the, the, the documentation of everything. And so we we got interested in doing and to integrate electronic lab books in this workflow. So we asked to our RDN team uh, for support uh, with regard ELAB FWL. However, I will say that I have not implemented still this in my in my workflow, but due to this, I uh, we have implemented in our in our institute, in fact, in our, with our practical uh, laboratories, and also between our PhD students. Uh, what we want to uh, to support now is the lab NDV. We want we are uh, involved in this project, which is uh, led by Jacob Harden. Or if you are interested, there was a, a, also a webinar in this in this series. Uh, uh, this is a, a some improvement really a good improvement with respect to the uh, uh, ELAF but needs a uh, su uh, support still needs uh, a lot of development now this is I consider this like a mostly the most important um, slide is how it looks my data management my data storage and how I do the preservation so now is this is uh, what we are doing uh, we have two machines we need to work on, on the electronic lab books each, uh, to each machine we have uh, uh, in, in, we have a store local store big uh, this to every every information all the information is sent to this this and we have the, the NAS provided by the uh, in the in, by the project so all the information is in back up here is a copy uh, all this information needs then to go to the long term or what we call cold storage. So for that we have a, 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 a new uh, we have we decide to go for LTO eight uh, so tapes uh, which allow you twelve or thirty terabytes. And this point we are going to split our information in two. As I said, for me the raw data or the projections it's going they are going to be in 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 some tapes and all the reconstruction in other tapes. That is for assuring the security. And um, what we are going to do with cyber is that our, our database is growing, growing, growing. And then what we can use is uh, cybers as a platform where I can do the analysis. I, uh, we have a really good uh, tools to do analysis uh, there. And we will continue with this, uh, with this link to the RDN. 
some words about these things, about the RD, uh, the vineyard yet. So now we have, uh, uh, do we have not, it's really new, so not all the users has been make publish or public, uh, making a, a final publication, but I have has started to use that. So uh, as Bernard is similar as Bernard. So I have here, for example, uh, I have loved uh, uh, a scan. I have all the metadata related to the scan. The user is, this is totally open. So you can download all the, the volume. Um, just display that volume in your, in your computer. We have a, D, a DOI. Uh, important for me is uh, what kind of data uh, metadata is important for this. I will discuss this in the next slides. But uh, it's also important to to sh to um, give the opportunity to the users that have not done the public either publication that is possible to to make uh, to put here what the experiment that is already done to just show them. Show the the, uh, the people that the experiment is, is done, and if, it, if they want to, to have more information, they can get in contact with the researcher. So we can do embargo or to wait uh, or to just to make the, the, the link with the people. Um, this is quite important: the metadata and the ontology. And, uh, during the first time, I was look basic my. Um, the decision of what is important for the publication and for a repository based in, in these uh, repositories, repositories in the USA, that mainly for, um, this, uh, for geology. Uh, and I, I try to, to match all, all, all these guys. However, due to, the, to my, my, uh, the data management plan, to go through the, the data, management, uh, data management, I realized that uh, the open microscopy environment ontology has recently uh, enhanced the ontology to include not only my light microscopy, but also electron microscope, uh, uh, X-ray computer tomography, uh, magnetic uh, resonance. So this is quite good because now we, there is a, a way to, uh, to, to, uh, to write and to all the standards uh, in a repository. Uh, anyway, I have, uh, to take care about all the other kind of uh, scans that are able to, uh, we can do in our machines. Because this, uh, as I showed up to now, is the standard tomography. There are several ways to do tomography in our infrastructure. And as I mentioned also before, it's necessary also to think in, in the future and to think on how uh, is, uh, we can pro uh, create the um, ontologies or metadata related or with the analysis that we are going to do on the volumes uh, produced by our, in our laboratory. There is a lot of challenge that I, I and of things that I have to, to take care in the future. Uh, mostly the most important is the legal, legal and security issues that we have to work in the user agreement. We have agreement related with the laboratory, but not related with the with the data, this is uh, I need to do it. Uh, another thing that I need to, to work uh, is uh, about the, the the samples. Now I am using uh, I am really taking care about the, the virtual object, but not about the real object. So I have a really a a, a good bar made uh, with a lot of samples, and I I need to, to take care about how I am archiving this also and to. I still relate the, the sample with the experiment. Uh, we need to implement the electronic uh, book uh, for all the experimental workflow. And in the future, we would like to have an image analysis server that allows all the users that doesn't have the opportunity to, to have a good computer, so doesn't have any uh, experience with the image analysis to do it in our server. And um, what is uh, quite interesting for me is that also the raw data that uh, is produced by the machines will be also open. So they are, as I said, third parties and also GNU uh, open uh, programs that can be used for users, uh, can be used for another uh, um, researcher, but doing the reconstruction from, uh, from scratch. Uh, last, I would like to just to promote something that is an initiative of our RDN team in our university is the so-called the so Data Champions Program in which I am part. And it's a network to promote research and data management practice across all the disciplines. Uh, and more or less, it's a forum 
we meet and we there and with uh, with the, our uh, data stewards and the the communication is more clear and uh, things are more really uh, at the level at the, our at our level and we are also the bridge with other researchers. So finally, I would like to thank to uh, the RDN team at Teugras, especially to Ilviri Hassani, to Herman uh, Shankofa, and Alexander Brua, who is also our, the data steward in our faculty and has helped us a lot with the data management plan for our PhD students. And Sarah, who was a former uh, 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 member of this team. So thank you. And if there is uh, any question, please don't hesitate. Thank you very much for your talk. So yeah, we have time for one question. Anyone, please unmute and ask. Okay, I don't hear anyone. Uh, no, Herman, you want? Uh, you, oh, Herman is just clapping hands. Uh, I would have one question, Eduardo, for you because you have all this all different types. So you have um, this graphic that you said that that you, that you said that is the the most important one, and you have this all data, and then you split it into open data in the repository and something goes to ciphers and the other one is the raw data. Is there any overlap between this data or these are just uh, disjoint subsets? No, no, there is not overlap. To, the, to ciphers, what uh, we have is a data, database related with all the metadata. Mm -hmm. So experiments, uh, ID, what was the kind of sample, uh, the machine, all power. So these things is more related to just to go there in the future, and uh, I need an example which has this, uh, this this shape, these characteristics, and I need to use this machine. What is going to be the best uh, option for doing the, the, the experiment? Mm -hmm. uh, no, and for the cyber for uh, our, the, um, the, our repository is this open is almost everything, is, except the the raw data because it's really big. The people. Mm -hmm. Normally, the researchers only want to see the virtual objects. So mm -hmm. what, this is what you can find there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we have to wrap up the webinar in two minutes. So I'm moving on to the next slides. Uh, basically, what I want to say is to say thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you very much for your exciting talks and to all other participants uh, i would like to inform that we're planning the next uh, webinars in this series so we will have one on the 20th of december about the updates in data management planning and the requirements of uh, the uh, funders this webinar will be in german and we'll also have one on the 12th of january about the cloud native labs on the austrian open science cloud this one will be in turn in english so please register for the webinars. Please spread the news. Maybe other colleagues would like to join. The recording of this webinar will also made, will be made available. So you can also forward the link uh, with your talks and with this webinar to, to the others. So thank you very much for participation and attention. And see you next time. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.